Hello and welcome from the Cointelegraph Research Terminal. I'll be your host, Michael Tabone, Senior Economist with Cointelegraph Research. Today's panel will be discussing the latest blockchain industry buzzwords, Web3 and Metaverse. Last year, venture capital investments in the crypto space were focused mainly on decentralized finance or DeFi. And over the past two quarters, this focus has shifted to the term Web3. Uh, Tim Draper, Web3 is a sector of the blockchain industry, which can mean a, a lot of different things. What does the term Web3 mean to you? And do you think it, it, the term might be too broad as it is used today? The media is capturing people's imagination and they're kind of going, Web3, like we got a new thing coming. And what it does is it forced me, and I'm sure it's forcing entrepreneurs everywhere to think, okay, with Web3, what can I do? And, and so all of a sudden they're, they're getting more creative. They're coming up with really interesting new projects that nobody ever imagined. And they're saying, <clears throat> we're, we're going to make it simpler for you, the user. In some ways, I think, oh, it's a hype monster that means nothing. And in some ways, I think this is such a great idea. It's like, like we're going to the moon or going to Mars and it gets people thinking, what's it going to look like? How exciting is this going to be? Uh, so that's my Web3 uh, diatribe. Absolutely. I love that. Um, Sumia Belridi, you're the founding partner of Keychain Ventures, which is an investment platform aiming to provide institutional investors exposure to the blockchain and Web3 ecosystems through funds and co-investment opportunities. But what are some of the trends in Web3 as you see them? And uh, can they be broken down even further, maybe even to more helpful categories, as, as Tim alluded to, you know, everything is just kind of yeah. jumped together. Yeah, I guess you know? um, I, I totally agree what uh, Tim said about Web3. It's, uh, it, it encapsulates all the innovation that is happening today. But if I have to simplify it, I think Web3 is about decentralization, right? So it's about decentralized technology that, you know, is used today for Bitcoin or for, for any other uh, ecosystem. Uh, for at least the general masses. Now, if we double click and we try to uh, look at what, what, what are the, the subsectors, let's say, uh, or the different layers in Web3, uh, it's today used as a catch-all within the industry for anything that we cannot define as a subsector. Uh, to give you some examples and illustrate maybe what today falls under Web3, we talk about digital identity, for instance. It has not emerged yet as a key, uh, a clear vertical. And today, to people put it in their reports or their reporting and their Web3. But eventually, as that category grows and that is drives more builders and more use cases and more applications, that will emerge as a new category and will not be any more uh, included in Web3. But, you know, in, in short, is a bit a catch-all uh, phrase for anything that is not yet defined and still being built and still very being very exciting to see emerge from this ecosystem. That's a great transition over to Julian Linger, who is a uh, from Rally, is a Bitcoin only app focused on helping to bring the next generation of long term investors and giving them simple user friendly experiences to stack Bitcoin, which I am a proponent of. And how has the process of onboarding people in the market since the downturn over the past few quarters? How is that? How has that journey been? Yeah, it has, it has changed quite a lot, actually. So when whenever uh, there's an uptrend in the market, look, mainly people, newcomers that we talk to or we uh, focus on, they look at price. So whatever, whenever the market is moving, there's more activity. Uh, usually the most activities in markets are moving up because there's FOMO. So for us as a business, it's basically free new customer acquisition, right? They're just, they're just coming. They're trying out everything that, as, as easy as possible, as fast as possible, and, and they want to get into it. They want to rush in to it. Um, whenever the market is stable, we don't see that much activity. We mainly see kind of the core Bitcoin community that is still running their savings plans, their DCAs, still buying the small dips, you know, but really the mainstream, the PR, the media, and therefore the normal people on the street don't really care that much. That was what we observed kind of in, in, in the second phase in a, uh, the last couple of months. And so there, what we see is basically, again, newcomers coming in because 
is they see a, a chance now, oh, the, 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 it's a cheap point of entry, and also the, the Bitcoiners obviously buying the dip um, and even e accelerating or increasing their savings plans amounts. The more the market moves, the more people are, are coming in, but different people are coming in. When it goes up, more newcomers are coming in. When, when it goes down, the, the Bitcoin only proponents or the Bitcoin maximalists, the enthusiasts basically, uh, stepping in with uh, bigger amounts. VC capital inflows have been on a decline since April, with October actually dipping down below $1 billion, uh, which is the $1 billion mark, which it hasn't done for a long over a year. Um, Mr. Draper, do you think that the rest of 2022 might see a slight change in this activity for VCs uh, who might have to meet financial obligations in a year, you know, for the year or whatever, for tax reasons or whatever it happens to be? Or are we likely to hover around this level of activity as firms remain risk off? No, investors always get it wrong. Um, they, <laughs> they come in when it's just hyped up and everything's great. And then the venture capitalists all have to compete with each other. And it's venture frat fratricide because all the companies um, fight each other to the death. And now, of course, would be the best time to be investing in venture capital. But um, the markets are down. People are not feeling that um, that kind of uh, comfort with their own portfolios. And they're saying, well, I can't take a risk on something that's venture capital. I can't invest in something risky right now. And so my advice to my entrepreneurs is go out and get your money from customers because the venture guys are um, tightening up. And um, and people, it, I mean, it's, it is a little bit more logical. You know, this is where Bitcoin would be awesome because right now we've got the Fed and the Fed kind of over overcompensates and undercompensates, you know, and so when when the Fed um, pumps interest rates up, the markets come crashing down. And um, and when the markets come down, then nobody has any money. <laughs> and so they can't risk their money. And they can't put it to work. And so then we we get sort of whipsawed back and forth. Um, if this were all a Bitcoin economy, it would be a stable economy and um, and people wouldn't have to go through these um terrible whipsaws where they have huge layoffs and everybody's out of work and uh, you wouldn't have to have that. You'd have a very stable um, economic system. And I think that people eventually will recognize this. Uh, it's right now, they, it isn't the way they're thinking, it isn't the way they're voting. Um, but uh, investors are, um, they do pile on when things are good and they pull back when things are tight, but it it should actually be the opposite. <laughs> this is a great time to be putting money into new startups. It's just amazing. Samia, you're, you, the firms that you engage with from all over the world, I'm sure are feeling similar sentiments to that. Um, what are some of the feelings and concerns you are hearing from your circles? Well, definitely, I mean, uh, recession, uh, uh, inflation has been a big concern over the last uh, year. And, you know, as Tim said, it's a very, you know, let's say difficult market for fundraising, both for funds and for projects. So uh, I guess, you know, uh, the trend is uh, is probably going to continue for 2023 and uh, projects will have to find uh, to be more efficient, to, you know, find more runway and maybe, you know, as Tim said, be able to get uh, capital or, or funding through sales and from their customers directly. So uh, I'm pretty excited about to see how, uh, you know, digital um, space in general, some of these applications could, you know, drive more adoption and drive more revenue and be able to be more profitable. Julian, where does Relay see themselves in the Web3 space, staying true to the Bitcoin only ethos? And are there any plans, potentially partnerships or expansions to your product offerings with that kind of mindset? Yeah, so I kind of look at Web3 in, in, in a historical way. I mean, historic, historical from like Web1, Web2 and Web3, whereas Web1 is kind of 
um, read only. So this was only like displaying things, texts and images and looking at it. Web 2 was now read and write. So you could also do stuff. You could interact with uh, services and other people. So social media and all that kind of stuff. And now Web 3 is read, write and own. So it's all about ownership of data, but it's also about real ownership of, of, of value. So it's this internet of value that in my opinion needs uh, an innovation decentralized network like Bitcoin and it doesn't necessarily need any other protocols um, because the, the true innovation of, of blockchain and crypto and whatever it's called today decentralized finance and all that kind of stuff is really Bitcoin. Yes, there are a lot of things with other protocols that are now like these other uh, 20k plus um, uh, to tokens and coins and blockchains. There are many things tried out which are interesting, but I feel that uh, it's play basically a playground where a lot of experimentation is happening and whatever will work will sooner or later uh, be uh, be manifested and implemented on the Bitcoin uh, network, which is not only the base layer. Like a lot of people always talk about Bitcoin as this base layer, but no, it's a, it's going to be a layered uh, innovation, like the internet having seven layers. Also, Bitcoin is now developing uh, several layers. So, for example, the second layer uh, called Lightning, and then many more like RGB and so forth, um, which will enable everything that you now see on these other. Uh, uh, protocols like smart contracts, NFTs, DeFi, tokenization, like all that stuff can happen on the Bitcoin blockchain. And that's for me the true uh, Web3 web that is going to develop in the, in the next decade. I would be completely remiss not to comment on the current state of the crypto market, which we all know does not exist in a vacuum and is impacted by the macroeconomic conditions across the entire world. This is a growing industry, the blockchain industry, that does face special challenges during times like this as we have seen with Three Arrows Capital, others, you know, now potentially FTX. Tim, in, your late, in, in our latest Cointelegraph research interview with Dan Tapiero from uh, 10T Holdings, we talked about regulation. Do you think with the recent issues that have popped up with different crypto custodians, they will only accelerate the call for regulation and, or can the industry come to its own aid? Well, I think regulators regulate at their own peril. Um, they're not, uh, it turns out that, um, countries that trust their people, uh, and create freedom end up with the best economic outcomes. And so every time you add a new regulation, you are hurting your economic outcome. The U S was very good in, um, in keeping hands off when the internet came. Uh, and I guess now that they're dealing with money, they're a little more um, control-based. The government officials are also sort of saying, wait, wait, <laughs> this is money. Information was one thing, but this is money. And they feel like they've got to control everything. And I think the control works to the detriment of a country. And so you're seeing some countries um, totally mess up, China and, Ru China and Russia with their total control free leaders. Um, and you're seeing some countries jump on the, the opportunity. Um, and those were Japan when they made it Bitcoin a national currency. El Salvador, beautifully done. Um, uh, now the, Demo uh, the uh, Central African Republic. Uh, yeah, uh, now they are making Bitcoin a national currency. The, um, Ukraine, uh, in a desperate situation, decided that, yeah, <laughs> Bitcoin counts. Um, and, uh, and, and so some of these countries are saying, Hey, we trust you. We think you're going to figure out how best to run your life. And, uh, and we will only step in if there are some real issues that are affecting many, many millions of people. Um, I think that's kind of my stance that the winners over the next 40 years are going to be the ones, the countries that decided that they were going to allow uh, Bitcoin to rip and, uh, and allow freedom in their countries. Freedom just works. It just, it, it's so clear in my head. You know, you look at South and North Korea, it's pretty clear. Um, you look at Cuba versus Hong Kong before she came in and took over Hong Kong. 
it, it's really clear that that the free countries are the ones that um, that thrive and the um, and the socialists, communists, dictatorship, government control, regulated countries just stagnate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Smeet, um, on our last interview, we uh, discussed a lot about regulation and we talked about institutions, um, you know, worried about regulation um, coming in as a good thing. Um, has your view changed on this at all or have from what you've heard from your circles, has it has they do they have a new understanding of it? Or are they still seeking that for regulatory clarity for them before they jump in? Yeah, I mean, on the institutional side, um, I'm still of the view that they need some form of regulation framework uh, to be able to adopt the technology in its fullest. Um, but to go back to Tim's point, I mean, I will nuance the regulation or I will split it in a few buckets. There is regulation for driving control and controlling populations, but there is also regulation just to provide protection for certain participants in the, in the ecosystem. Uh, obviously, I'm a proponent for regulation to drive protection, and I think having some form of regulation, I guess, from for 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 uh, institutional adoption is, in my view, pretty required. I mean, it's difficult to see how large financial institutions that are regulated today will jump onto something that is decentralized and you know where they would not be able just to operate in the way they've been operating today. So, but just to be clear, I'm not a proponent for just you know copy pasting the regulation that we have today and apply it on decentralized technology, obviously that's not that that would be the worst outcome mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, and um in America we've recently had bills proposed in America that talk about um uh, uh state to state trade, you know, the, the this interstate commerce clause. And it's it's almost laughable. Interstate commerce is not even a question. We're talking about something that is inner world. You know, it could be it's going to be on a satellite as well. Right. We have Bitcoin on a satellite. So it's it's everywhere. It's not just, you know, I don't have to worry about just Massachusetts to Connecticut. I have to worry about the whole entire globe. So this is almost laughable when you read when you know about the technology and you read the, the frameworks that are being out there, which goes or, uh, you know, the Howey test, you know, or something like that's written in 1960, whatever it is, you know, which highlights yeah. a very important yeah. point in my view about education of the regulators. Right. And I say, I feel that's, you know, something that is pretty much incumbent on us as players in the ecosystem to educate and drive more education and knowledge about what the technology is about. So that's, you know, the regulators can, you know, Come up with the right the right framework. Otherwise, we're going to see you know examples of what you just mentioned. Absolutely, Julian. You're a CEO of a of a blockchain company. Do you agree with with Tim and Smeet on on these points of regulation? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it should be it should be and it can be uh, over regulated. Uh, I think especially Europe where, where we are active, we're active in, in, in pretty much all the 40 something European countries and there uh, there's this new regulation coming up which is called Mika, uh, which is about you know framework for all crypto asset uh, handling and this it, it is it is held super strict so they even tried to um, ban things like mining or uh, transferring um, from custodial wallets to non-custodial wallets, stuff like that. So it's it's really uh, strict how they want to grasp it. Um, and as you as as you said, Michael, it's uh, it's really about you you cannot grasp this. It is it is a free technology. It's open source. It's out there. It's not going to go away. Back to your point, uh, uh, Smith, about regulation uh, about. Educating the regulators, I think this is super important. They will come to the conclusion that it is not possible and also not um, beneficial to try to uh, criminalize these uh, things like mining, for example. I mean, we saw uh, what what um, what happened after China um, banned mining, just the, the 30 percent of hash power coming from China. And this whole huge industry that was built around it, with all the you know taxpayers and 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 employments and stuff like that, it all it all went away within within a month or two. It just spread around the the rest of the the free world, and and just created prosperity there. Uh, so it was really a, sh a shot in the foot. It, it's something you cannot you cannot stop. Bitcoin doesn't care. Um, but but I think the regulators um, still are, are yet to understand this. But they will at one point. 
Tim, how are you working with your portfolio of companies to help them go through this market cycle? Well, um, <laughs> for the last two years, I always get it. It's like I get nervous during bull markets and I, I feel very uncomfortable. And um, and then during bear markets, I, it's like my time. I get all excited. Um, and so during the bull market, I said, oh, yeah, raise as much as you can. Just don't spend it. And a few of them actually listened. Some of them are running into walls now. And um, and so what I've told them is to focus on your customer, figure out how you can get money from your customer, see if you can turn profitable. I mean, that's that's a word that nobody's heard for five years. Um, and that um, and then, of course, in in companies where the burn rate's gotten too high, um, I suggest that it's time to lay some people off, and that um, always gets a lot of resistance. And so we, I tend to say, you know, you got to. I remember during the dot com bust, I said to a company, uh, "Well, you've got how many people do you have? Four hundred." And I said, "Well, you're going to have to cut that to three. And they said, three hundred. And I said, "No, three people, because." You, you got a lot of money and you're burning a lot of money, but you don't have customers yet. You got to get customers. Uh, I, I think they didn't take my advice and they crashed into the wall and died. It, these bear markets can be short or they can be long. If they're short, Hey, you cut back and you can always hire those people back later. If it's long, you're going to be in this for a long time. You got to figure out how to make money. Um, you're not doing anybody any favors by not making money. Smith, do you have any thoughts on, on that? No, I will totally agree with what Tim said. I think uh, what uh, you know, uh, founders and entrepreneurs tend to do badly in downturns is react fast, first of all. Sometimes it takes a long time for them to realize the severity of the situation and also build enough runway because as Tim said, we don't know if it's gonna be three months, six months, 12 months or 18. And you have to be, you know, provide for the worst and build for that, you know, worst case scenario because ultimately you need to be, you need to be able to weather the storm and come out, uh, come out from, from this uh, alive. I guess that's the end, that, that's survival mode uh, during these times. And uh, I think that's what sometimes get forgotten is you know we always feel that we reach the bottom and it's going to turn it's going to be a quick recession and in three months we're going to be back up and therefore we're going to absorb all of this but you know most often than not we are bad at judging that runway and we end up and you know we end up uh, not surviving or not making it through yeah I, I think from a from a founder perspective this is really true that you should act you should act fast and uh, you should really prepare for the long bear markets you never know how long it's going to be that's why the closer you come to a bear market or the more the deeper you go into the bear market the more closer you want to think about profitability and your runway i'm sorry for that um and and it's also about the the, the art of reassembling resources when everything is going up yes you can invest a bit more in marketing because it's easier to get like cheaper customers then um but then uh, and you can maybe neglect a little bit of of, of the product um and and build up some technical um adept but then when it turns and there's a bear market uh, you definitely want to stop like all the, 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 the ad spend and marketing budget because it's anyway going to be super uh, expensive to, to get new users. But then you should cherish the users you have and invest more in the product um, and also invest more in the team. I'm actually, I know this is kind of an American thing, this hire and fire. Whenever there's a bear market, you just, uh, you just fire the majority of the team. Um, not really where I come from in Switzerland. We really try and we did now keep keep all of our all of our people is only only 21 but uh, still um, because we really really believe that it, it's that the power that you have we need we just need to reassemble things and invest maybe as I said more in product less in marketing but we this is the, this is the the core value and the core power that we have and we want to keep it because if we now get rid of half of the team um, and then in a year from now we yes we can rehire them um, but it's going to, going to be a super expensive process uh, to get this talent again and to 
get them productive again, which where, where you lose maybe, in my opinion, even more time and money uh, than if you just find ways to keep them now and keep them productive and uh, invest more into, into the product so that you're uh, better positioned um, when the, the bear market ends. Uh, but in, in, in the end, it's really about surviving. Like the ones that survive, the, the, the big guys today in the crypto market are like the, the Binance and Coinbase and all these kind of guys. Uh, they're just they're just here uh, because they um, survive two, three, or four uh, bear markets, and most most of them don't. And the more bear markets you survive, the the bigger you get. Absolutely. One thing I learned from martial arts is sometimes it's not how good you are; it's just how who can last the longest. You know, so uh, <laughs> so sometimes that's the truth. Um, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate you guys being on the panel today and, and uh, being here. Julian Linger from uh, Relay, um, Tim Draper from um, everything from Twitter to, uh, to, uh, um, SpaceX to, you know, you name it. Um, uh, it's amazing. You're, you know, when I was grow growing up reading, uh, you know, you know, going to school for everything, I, you were one of the names I read about in books. So I'm honored to have you on the, po on the podcast. So thank you. And Samia Belridi, uh, who's always here. Thank you very much from Keychain Ventures. Thank you everybody for uh, tuning in and uh, hope to see you all in the next one. Thank you. Thank you.